I'm Carl Smith. I'm currently the advisor at Engineworks, although I don't really do much there except for a couple of hours a month. And uh, I guess I'm becoming a professional speaker. Wow. It's weird. So you're an advisor to a company that you started. How did you yes. go from being the guy who started a company to a guy who's just advising to that company? Uh, basically, I, I hired people I could trust. And over time, I gave them all of my responsibilities until I realized one day that I was the problem. There was nothing for me to do. So I was messing them up eight hours a day. And how did you find out that you could trust those people? Well, it took two years. <laughs> so over that two year period, you just watch people make mistakes and recover. Yeah. And uh, over time, you learn to take care and control and slowly move both of them away until you realize that they're fine. So you're, you're a father as well. Yes. It's, it's a little bit like raising children in that way? It, it's very much like raising children. Um, my dad was a child psychologist, and the piece of advice he gave me was, if you raise independent children, don't get upset when they don't listen to you. Uh, good and, advice. Uh, I'm at that point now with my 12-year-old daughter where she doesn't listen to me. My 10-year-old never listened to me. Um, but it's very similar to the company. Yeah. Uh, I recently offered to help on a project and they thanked me very nicely and then moved along without me. So <laughs> it's kind of beautiful actually. So you're, you're saying it's a good thing, it's positive, but it's yeah. not always felt like that. I mean, when we first met you, it, yeah. there was some, some, and, you know, some scariness. Yeah, it. absolutely. If, if you don't have form around it, if you don't have structure and expectations, it'll become a bloody mess really quick because you'll have different groups who have different expectations. We had a mm -hmm. younger group who was very aggressive about changing things, and an older group, I'm sorry, a seasoned group, <laughs> who very much wanted uh, to have a traditional structure. Yeah. And so it actually split the company in two, in a lot of ways, until one day I, I came back in and I said, look guys, somebody's gotta have the power to veto. <laughs> we didn't realize that, but it's gonna be me right now, and I'm gonna veto all of this silliness, and let's just get together and come together with a, a plan we can all agree on. Yeah. And so then over about three or four months, we, we started figuring out the groundwork that we could live with. So the other complexity that you dealt with is that your team is almost entirely distributed. That's right. There are a couple of folks that work in an office together, but for the rest, the team is all over the show. Right, and I think right now it's, I think it's over three countries and maybe five time zones. Wow. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about putting that team together and then managing that team, because that can't be easy. Okay, so putting the team together in terms of the current company? Yeah. Um, yeah. The team actually hired the team. So one of the things that, that I'm really happiest about is we realized early on that if you want people to have a sense of loyalty, what you have to do is make sure that the people they're working with are the people who wanted them. So the core team actually seeks out other people that they want to work with mm -hmm. and invite them in to work on a project. That's, that's the onboarding process is you actually join the team that wanted you on a project. And then over time, if it works out, they hire you. So the team hires the team. Now the flip side is the team fires the team. Right. So it's very much like Survivor. If it gets to a point where you're just not doing well, you will get voted off the island. And they've jokingly started referring to me being voted off the island, <laughs> which I'm, you know, I'm fine with it. Maybe. Not even the million dollars, <laughs> there's no prize money. There's no, no, I, the, the gift they're giving me right now, I could not, yeah, worry about. But so as a result of that, it was an organic growth. And sometimes the people in Seattle knew about somebody in London and they had either read a post they mm -hmm. did or saw them speak and they were like, we should consider this person. So it, it, it creates a bond because they know that somebody sought them out, they wanted to work with them. And when they get in, they don't want to let that person down. So. Even on a day-to-day -day basis, you're not managing them, they're managing each other, or at least guiding each yeah, other. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. It, literally, maybe two hours a month. Um, there's a new business meeting that I'll sit on, which is like 30 minutes, because one of the things, and, and the reason that I think they call me advisor now, is because I know the history of the company. I, I'm actually a historian in a lot of ways, because they'll go mm -hmm. after a new healthcare product, and I'll be able to say, oh, well, we worked with this hospital, we worked with their pharmaceutical, we worked right. with, so I can help them kind of round out the experience that they may not be aware of. I guess it's kind of bullshit for the client, though, I'm thinking about it, because none of those people are there anymore. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll edit that out in post. No. <laughs> so when you started the company, you were the founder, right? I, I was the founder uh, with three friends. Mm -hmm. um, it, was, it was my idea, but I would consider all four of us to be the founders. So when you started this, 
it feels like you've gone through quite a bit of an enlightenment as to giving up some of that Ooh. control, being able to trust other people. Yes. It's clearly not been the same or throughout. Tell us a little bit about Carl the person and, uh, <laughs> and how he's changed over that time. I, it was interesting. Tuesday night, I was at an event, and one of the questions uh, somebody said was, were you always a really nice person. I was like, <laughs> no, I was actually a real asshole until I was around 29. <laughs> and, uh, and I started realizing um, the company I was at did this research that was allowed them to see who was considered the most important person and who was considered the least important person. Mm -hmm. I had the distinction of winning both categories. Wow. And I realized I treated people differently. The only way that you can be considered the golden boy and the ultimate asshole is to treat people differently. Mm. So that opened my eyes a lot and, uh, and I started learning more about just being nice. I mean, there are books on it in different ways. You know, you, yeah. you can read How to Win Friends and Influence People, right? That's the, the big book by Dale Carnegie and uh, it's a little bit on manipulation. It's not necessarily, but right. when you start learning people's names and you just start to ask them how they're doing and acknowledge that everybody's on this planet has their space and their breath and their purpose, right? Yeah. Things just get so much better. So you kind of faked it until you made it. You kind of very much. I mean, I, until I realized I was in trouble yeah. <laughs> because I I was becoming bipolar and I didn't know it, right? Um, but yeah. So and then I just started reading and studying and uh, and really abandoned business books mm -hmm. and started reading about nature and science and history and and that really opened my eyes to to a lot of things. Yeah. And along the way, you've had guidance or help in the form of other people. What what's that? <sighs> You know, I would say to a degree, um, Melanie Husk, who was my original boss, uh, I took a tremendous amount of influence from her. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I'll say I watched her make a lot of mistakes too. You know, a, a lot of times you can learn just as much from, from those bad times. Um, but really, I, I didn't find a lot of people, my wife probably would be one of them, who would from time to time, with a laser focus, say something like, your family's coming over, you're about to get really uptight and cranky, why don't you just go for a walk and get okay with it, you know? Yeah. But overall, I didn't really have those coaches. I wish I had. I, I found myself fascinated with things like Buddhism and Taoism and, and pulling mm. myself into that um, just to learn how to let go. So we've spoken to a couple of other folks and some of them have formal mentors and advisors, some of yeah. them don't. Um, there doesn't seem to be any kind of pattern here. Right. But you, maybe your advice to somebody else coming up would it be to seek out that actively? It would absolutely be. Uh, I mentioned this in, in my session that, you know, Michael Jordan, the greatest basketball player in the NBA, had a coach. Mm. Tiger Woods, greatest golfer, had a coach, mm. right? Mm. Um, even if, if you look at, say, Hemingway, he had an editor, right? There, there are people out there helping the people that we think are the best. Why are we trying to do it all on our own? Yeah. So I absolutely would. In fact, I, I would love to find mine, you so, know? I know, yeah. yeah. I mean, there's a lot of times the talks that we've had before where I was like, oh man, I gotta get more Richard in my life. <laughs> Thank you. If we imagine what Carl's gonna look like in the next 15 or 20 years, is there a way for you to decide now what that might look like? Or It's gonna you... be really sexy. Really I sexy. I can tell you that. <laughs> um, you know, that's, that's a great question. In that time period, my kids will have moved on, mm -hmm. right? Um, Hopefully not your wife as well. Well, yeah, hopefully not. <laughs> I, I got to be honest. I'm not sure. As soon as the kids are gone, she may say, look, I've been She's waiting. Like, my work's here done. I'm right. thinking that, uh, um, you know, it's funny when you said that, I, I envision myself just traveling and meeting people, mm -hmm. you know, and, and trying to embrace but as many of those opportunities. What's that? You're doing that already. I'm doing that right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah I am. I, I think I would stay at the places longer, though. It oh. wouldn't be like these quick hits. I, and I don't know that it would necessarily be speaking. Mm -hmm. I think it would just be Connecting. being present. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good, I like that. Yeah, oh, me too. Let's do it. We should, we should do that. <laughs> um, so my last question is, okay. how do you want to be remembered by the people that you have had this connection with? When uh, my youngest daughter was six years old, right, about four years ago, she came out uh, to see me. I was outside and I was, I was working on something. And she asked me, she goes, what do you want people to know about you when you're dead? And I went, Creepy six-year-old girl, thank you for that question. <laughs> and I thought about it though, I was like, how do I explain to her what it is I want? Mm. And I told her, I want people to remember me as a nice person who was successful. You know, that just sums it up for me. That's good, Carl, thank you, appreciate Great. it. Great, thank you so much, Richard.